With only a few hours left with his disciples, what would Jesus say? It's hard, I think, for us to imagine or understand or grasp the bond that would have existed between Jesus and his disciples after three and a half years of being together almost constantly. There were these short periods of time where he sent them away on a journey. There were a few times when he withdrew himself from them and from everyone else. But they were together day and night. They camped out on the road together. They endured hardship together. They ate together. They slept al alongside of one another. They laughed together. They cried together. They rejoiced together over healings. They, they saw Jesus walk on the water together. They, they had more occasions, those disciples did, when every hair was standing straight up on their body than you and I will probably experience the rest of our lives. They were close. And he loved them. It said, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. They've had one last meal together, the last one until he will return, the last glass of wine together, and only just a very short time left to talk. What, would he have, what, what does he have to say? What, what of all the things, and there must have been many of them tumbling over and over in his mind, of all the things that Jesus might have to say to them, what did he say? What was important? What did he want them to remember? What did he want them to carry with them? We are profoundly indebted to one apostle. His name is John, because he is the one who really in detail recorded what Jesus had to say on that night. I doubt, frankly, if he gave them every single word. I expect what we have here is a precy, a, a, a kind of a, a summary of the things that Jesus said, picking out what, in John's mind, were the ones that were most important, that had lingered the longest, that had held him fast the most. This passage where he talks to them begins late in the 13th chapter of John. It's a segment from which every year at the Passover, having partaken of the symbols of the bread and wine, we read through selections of this passage of Scripture. And beginning today, I want to start through it verse by verse, uh, not just passages or selections, but all of it, to talk about the things that Jesus talked to his disciples about on this night. In verse 33, he said, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. I only have a little time left. There's a small incongruity in the fact of a man who is 33 and a half years old talking to a group of men about his own age and calling them little children. But you should know that this is a, a term commonly used by masters or rabbis for their, their students, their pupils, that is, the ones who studied under them. It's an affectionate term. Uh, it's a diminutive. And yet it has nothing to do so much with the age as with the relationship between master and teacher. Children, and yet a little while I am with you, and you're going to seek me. And as I said to the Jews, whether I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now John will elsewhere say he gave us a new commandment, but it wasn't a new commandment in a sense, because the idea that a man should love his neighbor has been there from time immemorial. It was there in the Old Testament. It was there. Abraham knew that he had to love his neighbor. It's been a constant down through history. But Jesus, in a way, does add something new to it. He says that you love one another as I have loved you, so you should love one another. And I really think that at this point in time, he takes this a level beyond where you and I would have it with our next-door neighbor, where loving our neighbor calls for not stealing his garden hose, for not kicking his dog, for for treating our neighbor right and treating our neighbor according to the commandments of God. But there should be among the people of God, among people in whom is God's Spirit, an affection, a love, and a caring that transcends that, that reaches out further than that, because Jesus did say, As I have loved you. Well, now, how great is that love? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. It is, according to Jesus, the defining term of who his disciples would be. It has a lot more to do with, with how we treat one another than you might ever imagine. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? 
And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. You'll follow me afterwards. In all probability, what Jesus is saying, you can't go with me to die now, but you are going to, before many years have passed, you will follow me. To the stake, in fact. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? I want to tell you the truth. The cock shall not crow till you have denied me three times. I don't know how he took that. I, I, I know that he denied it. I know that he did not believe it. But look at this thing from Jesus' point of view. One of his disciples, not all of them, but the one of them who tended to be the most, what shall I say, cocky, the most self-confident, the most, the quickest to speak, the biggest mouth, if you will, got up on his high horse and said, Well, other people might forsake you, but I'll go to the death with you. Now, Jesus knew his man, and he loved this man. Believe me, he loved him through and through. And loving him through and through, he could not allow him to get away with the hubris, with the, the vanity, with the ego, with the cockiness that Peter expressed in the statement. Now, he also knew one other thing about Peter. He knew that Peter thought he could do it. He knew that Peter meant that he could do it. But he also knew that if it came right down to it, that Peter was really not any stronger than the others. He was simply more bold. And there is a difference between having boldness and, and being impetuous, let us say, and having the real bedrock hard courage that's required to do what's, what, what has to be done. Jesus knew that Peter would follow him. Jesus knew he would be more aggressive. Jesus knew that he would be more impetuous. And he knew that all he had to do was cause him to encounter three significant challenges, and he would fail every single one of them. And he could arrange to have it done before the cock crew, so he told him this. He had it to do. Now, this is interesting to me from a lot of points of view, but not the least of which is that Jesus cared enough for Peter to bring his ego down. And so it is that from time to time in our lives... We are going to get cocky. From time to time, we're going to think that we've really got it by the tail. We're going to think we've got it wired. We're going to think that we know this. I'm sure of that. We're going to have a certain bravado about what we know, what we would do, how firm we would be in the service of God. And it may be necessary for God to say, all right, that's your, you say that. Let's see if you can deliver. For the truth is, any time we boast ourselves... Don't we hand God the right to say, can you deliver? Will you do it? Will you follow through? Will you produce? Now, that being the case, you know, ever since I woke up one day and realized that, I've tried to be a little bit more careful about what I say I'll do and what I say I intend to do and uh, about making promises and about being cocky about different things. It sneaks up on me from time to time, but nevertheless, that warning is there. So Jesus did, and we'll come to that a little bit later, teach Peter a rather bitter lesson about his own ability and his own strength. Let not your heart be troubled, he continues in chapter 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many abodes. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be, all, be also. Now, the, the simple logic and sequence of this event uh, is not that hard to follow. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again, so that where I am you may be also. Now, when he comes again, where is he? He's here. And when we are with him, where then are we? We're here. That's not hard. Why does he come back? So that we may be with him where he is. So this place that he is preparing apparently is coming back here with him. Now where I go, he said, you know, and the way you know. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. If we don't know how you're going, how in the world can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, I don't know how any statement could ever be made that was more absolute about the way to the Father, about the way of knowing God, of accessing God. I am, he said, the way. I am the, the, the way that you must walk in. I am the way to the Father. I am the truth. That what you hear me speak is true, it is correct, and it is right of the Father. And no man can come to the Father but by me. You can talk all you want to about there being many ways to God, that there are all sorts, people serve God in their ways, and there's a road to God that goes through, through Buddhism, there's a word to God that goes through some other way. Whereas Jesus said plainly, I am the way. No man go, comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him. And in fact, you have actually seen him. That was a little too much for Philip, having sat there quietly listened to all this, and he had to speak. He said, he said Lord, show us the Father, and, and it will suffice us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? You want to know the Father? And I've been with you three and a half years, working day and night, and you still don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say then, show us the Father? Now, the one thing that is abundantly clear, that Jesus came to reveal the Father to man. That in fact, there was a very good case that could be made that no man really understood or knew or grasped who the Father was until Jesus came and revealed the Father to man. And certainly there is no indication that man was ever able to relate to God. Now notice the word relate. To relate to someone, you really are supposed to be a family member. No man was ever able to relate to God as Father short of Jesus Christ. With Abraham, well, Abraham was a friend of God. God came walking down the road to where Abraham lived. God sat down with Abraham, and Abraham killed an animal and prepared food for him, and they actually shared the same meal together. And they walked along the road and talked together. And Abraham is called a friend of God. There is no quite, not quite the suggestion here that Abraham ever related to God as the Father. And so when Jesus told his disciples, asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, After this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father, who art in heaven. And of all the words that Jesus spoke, these are among the most important. For they grant to us, who are his servants, his disciples, baptized in His name, forgiven of our sins by His blood, He grants us access to God as Father. Paul even tells us a little bit later in one of his epistles, we cry, Abba, Father, meaning that the relationship with God has gone beyond the, the abject servant lying prostrate in the dust and, and, and crying out for mercy. It has gone beyond one whose face and forehead are to the ground and, and who dare not consider himself as anything except a worm in the presence of God. It has transcended that and gone on to the place to where a man can actually, or a woman can speak to God as a father, intimately and closely, rather than worm to exalted being. Now, the relationship between God and man or between God and those men whom he has called and granted that privilege, changes completely with Jesus Christ. As we are granted an access to the Father, which in a way and at a level that no one has ever been granted before. Now in saying, he who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus was not claiming to be the Father. What he is simply saying is that he was like the Father. He carried out the Father's works. He was the expression of the Father's will. He did the things the Father told him to do. He, all the things that one might want to know about God were all present in Jesus Christ. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. My father and I weren't quite that much alike, but there might be people who would say, Oh, you've seen old Ron. You've sure seen his dad. 
We were both tall. We are both bases. Uh, he was a little better looking than I am. Uh, he parted his hair in the middle, so there were a few differences along the way. But there was no question about who belonged to who. If the two of us were in a crowd, you've seen me, you've seen my father. Believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Don't you understand that? That he is in me and I am in him. The words that I speak unto you, I don't speak of myself. The Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. I mean, we've got to find something that you're going to believe here. Now I say to you, he that believes on me, you really believe me? You really trust me? You're really willing to put your confidence in me. The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. The implication of this is that if Jesus stayed here, that the capacity for his disciples to do the works he did and to transcend the works he did wouldn't happen. Now, he doesn't explain that. He doesn't really anywhere tell us specifically why, beyond the fact that he says that when he goes to the Father, he will send a comforter, he will send the Holy Spirit, that, and will himself, it seems, administer the Spirit to man in such a way that they are empowered and are able to do things. Now, a lot of people have asked me, saying, the question over the years, have said, well, how is it that he says that we will do greater works than those that Jesus did? Because Jesus, uh, you know, he went around, he healed people, he walked on the water. I mean, he could empty out a sick ward quicker than anybody could. Uh, and, and, and they start ticking off the things that Jesus did, and we haven't done any of those things. Maybe that's not what Jesus is talking about. Maybe Jesus does not consider the capacity to heal a withered hand among his greatest works. We would tend to look at it that way. The fact that a man is dead and in a cave, and they call him out and he's alive like Lazarus, well, now, that's a great work. The fact that a man was born blind and he comes along and, and heals him so that he now can see, now, that's a great work. But again, all we're doing with this is dealing with the flesh, a fleshly body that died, and we bring it back to fleshly life, a fleshly body that can't see, a fleshly body that can't hear, a fleshly body that can't walk, and we grant to this fleshly body all these fleshly things, and those are great works. Is it not a greater work to grant eternal life to a man? Not merely to bring him back to life for a while, but to grant him life forever? Is it not a greater work to grant forgiveness of sins? Isn't it a greater work to introduce a person to God as Father and as Savior and as Lord and as Master? Now, how many people did Jesus convert in his three-and-a-half-year ministry? How many people were baptized and, and really were followers and disciples of Jesus in that period of time? A couple of hundred? 120? How many was it? It was two, 120, wasn't it, that was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost? There were probably more disciples than that, but there's no indication that there were very many more than that. Then when Christ returned to the Father and administered the Holy Spirit by pouring it out on them on that day, how many people were baptized that day? More people were baptized in one day by a factor of, what, uh, 30 to 1 or 20 to 1 than Jesus did in three and a half years. If you want to consider... A sinner changing his ways, a man repenting of his ills and his evils, a man setting his feet in the right way to serve God, a man beginning to live a new life in Christ, a man headed for the resurrection from the dead to live eternally is a great work. The disciples did a greater work on the first day that Jesus had done for three and a half years. And there's no reason to apologize for making such a blasphemous statement because Jesus said it was going to happen that way. He said, you will not only do the works that I do, you will do greater works than these because I go to my Father. And of all the works that a man can do, you know, I, it is curious in a sense that the church feels somewhat deprived because there are not more healings. There are not more miracles. Uh, there aren't more spectacular displays of the Holy Spirit or these things beginning to happen. And yet, when I think for a moment about what Jesus told us we were supposed to do after he left, 
He said categorically, go into all nations and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all things that I have commanded you. This is the work. This is what you're supposed to be out there doing. And for us to have the chance to participate in that, to actually even to some degree do it ourselves, as we in the process of, of sitting down and chatting with someone that we meet on a, on a, on a bus or a train, uh, of having a conversation with someone by the wayside somewhere and just chattering away about things, and we happen to be able because they had a question or they commented about life or they were frustrated with life, and to be able at a personal one-on-one -on -one level to explain to someone like the Ethiopian eunuch had Philip come down and explain to him from Isaiah about Jesus Christ. To have the chance to, to help someone one-on-one -on -one is a privilege beyond measure. And it's a privilege that is just as open to you as it is to me. I've got maybe a chance to talk to more people at a time than you have. But the chances come to us every day of our lives. There are people who cross our paths all the time. And we aren't ready. We aren't prepared. We haven't got our mind in such a condition that we can say some things to them that might help, that might change something. It can be something as simple. And I, I think this great classic of, the, of Philip, who has come all the way down, God's brought him down alongside a highway where a man's coming back from Jerusalem on his way home to Africa. And he's reading out of the book of Isaiah. And Philip simply says, do you understand what you're reading? What a remarkably simple question that is. And the man said, well, how can I except somebody explains to me what this is all about? Prophecy here is not easy. So Philip climbed up in his chariot with him and went on down the road and began to preach to him right where he was in Isaiah. Talked to him about Christ, explained about Jesus, and they got down the road and the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, there's some water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. Baptized him right there. No six-month probation period, no long, let's find out if you can bring forth the fruits of repentance. The man believed, he repented, he was baptized, and that was that, and he was on his way. I told that story in a sermon a long time ago on personal evangelism. And someone who heard that story told me one day, he said, it was the strangest experience and feeling I had in my life. He said, I was walking into the bank, and I'd gotten, I think, a key to go into a safe deposit box. And when he was going through a door, there was a woman sitting there reading the Bible. Really an unusual thing to be happening in that place at that time when he walked by. He'd gone by her, and he remembered the sermon, and he stopped, turned around, came back out the door, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And she said, well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And he pulled up a chair and she said, they sat there and talked for an hour and a half or so about the Bible. He had no idea what came of it. He had no idea where her life went from there. But he touched a person's life because he was willing to stop and just say, do you understand what you're reading? He didn't have to have all the answers. A lot of times being able to help someone ask the right questions is enough. It's difficult enough, believe it or not. So the works that need to be done, the work of evangelism is, in my opinion, the greatest of all the works that God has given to his people to do. And it's something which we have been about for a long time and I guess will be about until our dying day. Whatsoever he says you will ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, tell me something. Don't have to tell me out loud because we don't embarrass anybody here. How many people on this earth do you know that you can say that to? You ask me anything you want to ask, and I'll do it. Name it. Most of you guys won't even say that to your wife. Because what she's going to say is, well, hang up your clothes. Start putting things away when you get them out. And you've said it. I, whatever you ask me, I'll do it. You've got to do it. How many friends do you have like that? Do you have any idea what an expression of confidence it is in a person to say, I trust you so much that you, you name it, you got it. I don't have very many friends like that. 
don't have too many people that I have that kind of confidence that I can say, what do you want? It's yours. But to have friends like that in a lifetime is a rare thing. Now, here comes Jesus. I want you to think about this now. He had a lot to give. It would be one thing for some poor old guy who doesn't have anything, you know, and barely has a place to live, is renting his little apartment down there and drives an old clunker that may make it home tonight and may not. It's one thing for you to give him to say, hey, ask me for anything you want, I'll give it to you, because he can give you everything he's got and have not lost much. But we're talking here about somebody who's got everything, all power, name it, and he says, ask for it, you've got it. Now, why then is it that we ask him for things and we don't get it? Because I would say that all of you here have got a few things on that you could probably list off for us right here. That you have wanted, asked for, needed, prayed for, asked about, ask it in Jesus' name and you still don't have it. I wonder how that could be. Well, you should know something. That this is a statement of ultimate friendship. And Jesus will develop that statement of friendship a little bit later. It's a statement of ultimate friendship. But friendship is a two-way street. For Jesus to come along and say to you, whatever you ask me, I will do it, presumes that you are willing to do the same thing back. Whatever, you, whatever I ask of you, now you've got to be willing to do it. Anything. And in a sense, when you repent of your sins and you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you die in the waters of baptism and are raised again into a new life, you enter into a new relationship with God. You have entered into a, a, a blood relationship. Now, if you'll recall, at the Last Supper, Jesus took a little cup of blood, actually wine, which symbolized blood, passed it around to his disciples and said, Here, drink you all of it. This is the New Testament in my blood. Now, that would be lost on a lot of Western readers in the modern world because they really have, you know, without some kind of a background or some kind of a history of blood covenants, they would not really know what was meant. In the oldest times, uh, it was very common for, for a couple of men who were going to enter into covenants, among, among Semitic peoples in particular, to cut themselves, each of them, drain a small portion of their blood into a cup, trade it, and drink one another's blood which then means, I've got your blood in me, you've got my blood in you, we are family, we are brothers. We now have, and we promise and expect, all of the obligations of kinship. You know, if you're my blood relative, you came out of my father's loins and been from my mother's womb, I have obligations to you that I might not have to just anybody. I can allow certain things to happen to some people I know in the world, but not to my own sister. There are certain limitations. I have obligations that are there. I have obligations to a mother, to my father, to a brother if I had one, which I don't, but to my sister, which I do. Uh, we all have obligations to our families. Well, this is saying that, that, you know, we become blood brothers, we partake of this, and we become members of the same family. Now, as time passed, God prohibited that kind of covenant with his children. He did not allow them to do that kind of drinking of human blood. And I'm not so sure but what the prohibition in the Bible against drinking of blood had more to do with the making of covenants, because by the way the word make a covenant in Hebrew is to cut a covenant, had more to do with cutting a covenant than it did with uh, whether or not it was healthy for you to be drinking blood. He didn't want people doing that. But nevertheless, what he did tell them was, and what, what he did allow in the custom was, they would often kill an animal at one period of time, they killed the animal, and both of them drank the blood of the animal. He stopped that, too. But they would kill the animals and pour his blood on the ground, and they would share the flesh of the same animal, eating the animal, and thereby entering into this covenant relationship with one another. It was just a covenant. So along comes Jesus, and he gives them wine and says, Here, this is my, a symbolic of my blood of the new covenant. He gave them bread, which, which he then broke and handed to them. and says, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to eat this. And so that the, the Passover service is actually a renewal, which we do once a year, of the covenant that we have with Jesus Christ. It is a blood brotherhood. We are family. We take on obligations. We say to him, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. He says to us, 
Whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. And the requirement, the bond, is there. I can only imagine what it meant to these, to these 11 men who were left at this time. Because Jesus made no such promise to Judas, he was gone. He was out of there. To hear Jesus say, whatever you ask me, I will do it. Then he went on to say, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Funny thing about that word comforter. The word is actually parakletos in the Greek, and it means advocate. Sort of like you go to court, you've got a lawyer over here who is your advocate. So the Holy Spirit is in that way an advocate with the Father, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him, doesn't know him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. This is a strange statement in a way, and we've often wondered about this because it sounds like what Jesus is saying. is not that the Holy Spirit wasn't around prior to this time. Not that there weren't people in the Old Testament who were guided by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, directed by the Holy Spirit, and so forth. He says the Holy Spirit is with you and shall be in you. A new locus for it, a new placement, a new relationship, even where the Holy Spirit is concerned. And it is in this, basically, that God the Father and Christ the Son dwell in us. Is because that Spirit, which has been with us, and in one sense you could even say it had been with them in the person of Jesus Christ for three and a half years, and is going to be in you. And so he goes... To say, He dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now that phrase is interesting because the, the Greek word actually is orphanos, for which we get the word orphan. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What a marvelous thing to think about it. Is I don't want you guys to be down here like a bunch of lost children. I'm going to come to you. And he's not talking about his second coming. He says, I'm going to be back. I'll be with you. I will be in you. I will be in you in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the, the comforter or the advocate that we have with God the Father. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he's the one that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know, the the commandments of Jesus go all the way back to the first one he ever gave to a man. Now, of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden you may not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. It was the spokesman of God that spoke to Adam and told him that. It was the word of God. It's the one you and I have come to know as Jesus Christ. His commandments go all the way back to the Ten Commandments. They include all the statutes, all the judgments, all the commandments, all the ordinances, everything God ever gave to Israel. He said, if you love me now, he that has my commandments and keeps them, that's the person that loves me. That's one of the ways I know. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not Iscariot, because he's gone, says, Lord, how can you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. We will come unto him. We'll make our abode with him. You know, he's, he's basically saying, If you love me, the Father and I are going to move in with you. Just going to move in. We're going to be there. It's going to be our house. We'll be there day and night, all the time. Where you go, we go. He that doesn't love me and doesn't keep my sayings, and the word which you hear, by the way, he said, is not mine. It's the Father's. This isn't some new set of commandments coming from an alternate person. As Herbert Armstrong always used to like to say, a smart aleck young man who's come down to do away with all of his father's commandments and to give give him something else to do that they'd never heard of before. He said, oh, no, no. What I've commanded you to do is what my father commands you to do. These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is an empowering agent. It helps you to, to teach us. It calls things to remembrance, helps you to recall things. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't let it be afraid. Now, I always thought in terms of peace, I, I, I could imagine a peaceful scene of a green grassy riverbank with a slow flowing stream going by and a nice shade tree being there and birds singing in the trees and little bees buzzing around hither and there and sitting with my back to the tree and my bare feet out in the grass and a fishing pole with a, with a bobber out there in the water and kind of hoping the fish doesn't strike and, and dozing off a little bit. And I, that, that to me is, is my ideal of a peaceful scene. But Jesus said, not just any peace, my peace I give unto you, and I'm not going to give you the kind of peace that the world considers peace. Oh, I see. Uh, well, what is it then? Well, the peace that he is going to give to us is the kind of peace and confidence that, that will allow you, when you are in jail and with your feet in the stocks and with a threat of court and possibly even your life in the morning, to be able to hold hands and sing songs and to praise God and to be thankful for the chance of being there to honor him with your presence. That kind of peace. No turmoil, not, not sweating it, just knowing that God is with you and that, that he will bless you and that he will see you through it. It's the kind of peace that when you're you know, sitting in front of a doctor and the doctor has just told you that said those, that terrible word cancer and you know that it's true, that you know that whatever God has in store for you, whatever lies down the road ahead of you, that he will not forsake you, he will be with you, no bit of pain that you suffer will be meaningless, that you will, have, that you will be suffering in whatever time you are suffering with Christ, that his power is with you to either heal you or not. And you can be with the confidence that the three Hebrew children were when they threatened them with a fiery furnace and said, if you don't fall down and worship the king, you're going into that fiery furnace. They said, oh, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, know this, we will not bow down. We will not serve this idol. Their confidence was such that they believed God would deliver them, but if he didn't deliver them, that was okay too. Now that's, that's faith. It's a powerful faith. Because oftentimes, we really don't know what God is doing. You know, there's a lot of things that God does that puzzles me. If you expect me to be able to tell you why God hasn't healed you, you're talking to the wrong person. I don't have a clue. If you want me to explain why it is that God does this or why it is that God does that, maybe I can give you an idea. Maybe I can give you an opinion. Maybe I can give you some scripture. But often as not, I'm going to have to say, I don't know. But I do know one thing. I do know what you and I are supposed to do today. Do you understand the difference? I have no idea, you know, if, if, if something happened that we lost all of our television stations this next week. I, I wouldn't have a clue as to why that had happened, what God might have in mind, why he allowed it to happen. We could all just, you know, stare at one another and maybe cry some bitter tears, and we wouldn't have a clue as to why God did it, but we would still have a clue as to what we were supposed to do. We are supposed to get on with the work by whatever means we have. The Apostle Paul ran into obstacles from time to time. He said, you know, we tried to go into Bithynia. and Couldn't go. Tried to go over here. It couldn't go. We had about three doors in a row slammed in our face. And we're sitting down here at Troas wondering, well, what in the world is next? Where should we go? What should we do? They didn't know what God was doing. They just knew what they were supposed to do. And that was when the man of Macedonia appeared to him in a vision and said, come over and help us. And something that he hadn't thought about was suddenly opened before him going to Europe with the gospel for the first time. And so he went. So the fact that God slams a door on your fingers, uh, the fact that he closes something up that you thought was going to be open, the fact that he doesn't answer your prayer quite as quick as you thought he ought to, practice, to do it, or that he comes along and says, I'm not going to answer your prayer, this particular prayer at all. I'm going to answer it a totally different way. You get an answer, the answer is no. 
Why? Don't ask me. But what do you do? Oh, ask me. You know, I can tell you that. I can tell you what you ought to be doing. But don't ask me why God answers. Don't ask me why he does not. Don't ask me why he kills. Don't ask me why he makes kills one and makes another one alive. For he does what he wants to. He is sovereign. And he does what he does for our best good. So maybe a lesson for us to learn is that we can be comfortable with that and find a kind of peace that in all too many circumstances gets away from us. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't let it be afraid. You can actually have something to do with whether your heart's troubled or not. You can actually make some choices about depression. Now, I know that there are physiological causes of depression. I know that there are chemical causes of depression. I know that some of us have messed up our own bodies to the extent that, that, that sometimes it's hard to be cheerful and nothing's working and everything's falling apart on you. And yet, there's no way that Jesus would have come along to us and said, don't let your heart be troubled. If you couldn't have something to say about that, and some decision to make about that, some way of responding to it. And I think that the way in which that response comes is, again, I don't know what he's doing, but I know what I have to do. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how I am supposed to respond. I know where I am supposed to be. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. So there's no reason to dwell on and let my heart be troubled and to wallow around in my despair if I can go to work, if I can begin to do, if I can begin to accomplish some things. You have heard how I said to you, I'm going away and I'll come to you again. If you loved me, uh, boy, I wish you wouldn't put it that way. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go to my father. For my father is greater than I. Reminds me of some funerals I've been at, you know, where the preacher's up here saying now that this, you know, our, our sainted mother, she's up there in heaven with God and, and the angels are singing and how wonderful it all is and all of us are sitting right here bawling our eyes out. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He says, you would rejoice it because I'm telling you I'm going to my father and yet you're, you're not rejoicing. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. This is getting close to the end of what I have to say. Because the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, and let us go from hence. So I gather they must have gotten up and began to walk, but he didn't stop talking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he purges it, that it may bring forth much fruit. Now there's a funny thing about us as, as Christian people, is that we have a habit of sort of starting to think of our, our group here as the vine and us individually as being the branches. Whereas Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. He purges it, that it may bring forth much fruit. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide, abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. And Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. By, you know, you'll, you'll judge them by what they're doing and by the results and the things that they're turning out and the accomplishments they're making. And he said very categorically that unless we remain in him, we cannot bear fruit. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. 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 Not something, not part of it. You have got to remain in him. 
If a man doesn't remain in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done to you. You know, a lot of us in years gone by had to struggle a ways with that because oftentimes that scripture was used to try to impress upon us that we ought to stay in our church as a part of staying in the vine even when our church was wrong. And our church had made a wrong turn. The church was doing the wrong thing. And here's a church right here, right now. Is that what he's talking about, that regardless of what we're doing here, regardless of what I'm telling you up here, regardless of anything else, that you're supposed to just stay put and do, do the same thing, whatever it may be? I don't know. He says, if a man abide not in me, in Christ, what's involved in that, folks? Well, if we go back to what he's been saying before, he's talking about doing the things he said and keeping his commandments and following in his way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If you stay in me and my words stay in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Christ is the vine, and all of us are branches, and we have to stay in him. You know, the church is so powerful and so helpful because through the church we exhort one another. Through the church we, we jab one another in the ribs. Through the church, if we began to drop aside or get or lose interest, somebody comes along and takes us by the hand and says, Hey, what's wrong? Is there anything we can do to help? Uh, you know, let's pitch in and help one another. The ability to, to call, to encourage, to uplift, to, to help people when they're down and out, to help people when they're low and discouraged, to help people when they're alone, is the work of the church. It's something the church is supposed to do. But it's to keep us in Christ that it does that work. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now I want you to continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be f fulfilled. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. How many times is he going to tell them this, I wonder, before it's all over? Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, remember a little earlier he said that I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, there's a funny thing about love. I mean, it is a word that has been more abused than about any word in the English language, I think. Perhaps the most important word in the language, and yet it's more abused, misunderstood, than any other word in the language. But do you notice what he says? That the love is not a matter of the way you feel. It is a matter of what you do. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, would you do that? Well, you get tested on it every so often. I don't mean that somebody asked you to die. But you see, your life is made up of time. It's made up of hours and days, minutes, seconds, bits and pieces of time. And there are times when you are asked to lay down some of your life. Maybe an hour, hour and a half, maybe a day. Maybe what you're asked to lay down is money. What you're, maybe what you're asked to lay down is property. Maybe what you're asked to lay down is shelter. For, I don't know, but your life uh, does not consist in the things that you possess, and yet they are all a part of the things that you work for, sweat for, strive for, give yourself for, sacrifice for. And from time to time, you have a little choice of laying down this little piece of your life. And then you lay down this little piece of your life. And then you lay down this little piece. And you pick up the phone, and you lay down another little piece by a long-distance phone call, plus an hour and a half of your time. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. It'll be a while before any of us are called upon to die for our friends. Maybe we will. I 
Maybe we'll have to face it because Jesus suggests that the time will come when people who thought they were brothers will actually betray one another, turn their backs on one another, turn one another over to the authorities to save their own skin, their own life, and wouldn't, do, wouldn't lay down their life for the brother. Maybe, maybe we'll be called upon to do that someday. We can know a lot about how we will respond to it by what we're doing right now and how we lay down our lives, not for the church, but for one another. Because the church, I don't know if you know this or not, folks, the church is an abstract. The church is an abstract concept. A church is an assembly. What I see in front of me right now is a church. By 6 o'clock tonight, there will be no church here. You will all be gone. One person here, one person there, one person in another place. And this, this seemingly solid entity upon which we can depend and trust and so forth and so on, it's gone until it comes back together again. And, of course, in one manner of speaking, we are one in the Spirit, and we still are an assembly of the firstborn written in heaven no matter where we are, that we're a part of one another in those circumstances. But you take my meaning, don't you? That the physical, concrete, working church comes together, makes its preparation, and then it's gone. Why is it gone? Well, because it's got to work. You see, people used to think in the old ages that one of the great things that man could do was to come out of the world and go live in a monastery somewhere. We'll all go there, and we'll all come together, and we'll live together in these environments, and we'll be together all the time. Whereas the idea God seems to have is you come together to reinforce one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another, feed one another, so that you can work. Go out and do the things that need to be done. He continues by saying, I have told you this. I'm sorry, you, I, you rejoice because I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, so that when it's come to pass, you might believe. I won't be talking with you very much anymore. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Let's go hence. These things that he tells us, I don't know where we're going. Even Jesus himself seems not to have known everything that was just over the horizon. But he did know what he had to do. To lay down his life for his friends. Our turn may come.